one of my very favorite passages from scripture is Psalm 8. It is one of my favorites, both because of how beautiful it is, but also because it was what I preached on for the very first candidating that I had in 2009. It has always been close to my heart. I want to read for you a bit of Psalm 8. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of, the mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. This is about human dignity, Psalm 8, I mean. It is, of course, a psalm of praise. It's a song that is meant to be sung at night, when you can see the moon and the stars which God has established. It's a song of praise for God over the beauty of the night sky with its stars scarce to be counted, with its moon with cool reflected glow, with the Milky Way pointing out towards the shape of the galaxy. What are human beings to the creator of such uncanny distances that even light, even light should tire in crossing them? What are mortals to the one who has seen stars be born and die when ours is fourscore years? This is a song of praise for God, yes, but it is about human dignity. All of this praise at the splendor of the night sky, the purpose of it is made clear with this turn. Yet, you have made humanity a little lower than the angels. It's a song of praise, but Psalm 8 is about human dignity. All people, no matter what, all people are holy and worthy of reverent treatment because we are fashioned by the very same hand that has made the stars and the moon. It is not something that we earn by good behavior or can lose by lack of proper accomplishment. Even from the mouths of babes, we hear, even from the mouths of babes, from the infant's helpless cry, from these human dignity shines because the maker of heavenly glory has made us only a little lower than the angels. It is a soothing word to hear today, a balm for my spirit. It's one that I need because human dignity is not having a great year. There are active wars in Myanmar, in Sudan, in Ukraine, in Gaza. Public officials in this country, prosecutors, judges, our own mayor even, they're threatened with violence merely for serving the public, merely for doing what they promised to do. Black people are still struggling under racist systemic disparities in hiring and health outcomes in lending. Women must secret themselves across state borders and LGBTQ youth must secret themselves in the closet for real justified rational fear. And all of that, all of those things, the wars and the persecutions, all of that, those are things that people are doing to one another on purpose. These aren't accidents or volcanic explosions or meteors hurtling toward the earth that have nothing to do with us. This is things that people are doing on purpose. Those who are a little lower than the angels, treating the dignity of another who is little lower than the angels, as nothing. It's a tough year for human dignity. This weekend, in fact, it is the most poignant moment, I think, to reflect on that since Monday is Martin Luther King Jr. Day, a holiday that we honor when we honor the legacy of a towering figure of the civil rights movement and struggle for universal human dignity. 
a towering figure who was assassinated as a martyr to the cause, a brilliant orator, and a master tactician. Shouldn't that have been enough? If that's not enough, then is there anything that can be enough? Is there anything that can be enough to see this country and this world clear to justice and dignity and rights for all? The message of the movement that Martin Luther King Jr. was so central to, the message is important. That is true. It also must be remembered that the methods are important. In some sense, the methods are the message. Nonviolence is a way to sum it up in a word, but in the vagaries of the English language, nonviolence can sound like a sort of a negation, as if as long as nobody gets hurt, then nonviolence has been achieved. That is not what nonviolence, as Reverend Dr. King practiced it, means. I can shout foul words at my neighbor, but the mere fact that I keep my hands to myself doesn't make it nonviolence. In his first book, Stride Toward Freedom, Reverend Dr. King describes some key principles, some methods of nonviolence. Nonviolence seeks to win friendship and understanding. The result of nonviolence is redemption and reconciliation. Nonviolence seeks to defeat injustice, not people. Nonviolence recognizes that evildoers are themselves victims and are not evil people. Nonviolence holds that suffering can educate and transform. Nonviolence accepts suffering without retaliation because in so doing, we can offer transformation and a path to wholeness for the one perpetrating wrong. Nonviolence believes that God is on the side of justice. These principles laid out in this book, Stride, these principles positively crackle with a true embrace of human dignity, a full embrace. First, that no one deserves to live under unjust oppression. And then also the acknowledgement that if I oppress another child of God, I have debased myself by falling so short of what God has made me to be. Nonviolence seeks reconciliation rather than a mere defeat of wrongdoers who, even if defeated today, can always find another day to strike unless they are transformed. And it is that transformation, it is that transformation of the human person that can seem like a miracle or a mirage or the Messiah's work that comes from God. That is why the path of nonviolence is one of faith. Nonviolence is a path of faith, a path of human dignity that knows that people are made but a little lower than the angels and that those perpetrating wrong can be called back to the better angels of their nature. The transformation of humanity and nothing less. The transformation of humanity is the goal and end of violence. Now, this might seem a naive goal. It might seem like a, like a failure to reckon with the lessons of history that would point away from such idealism. But if history remembers anything well, it is wars. History remembers wars well. And you can always easily track and trace the path from one war to the next. History remembers wars well. The methods of war have had plenty of time to work, and they have not. What is needed is the transformation of humanity, and that is not even something that war is trying to do. All of that, all of the tenets and principles of nonviolence, they were rightly applied to racism in the United States in the 20th century. And the fact that so much is left to accomplish should not discourage us, 
because Reverend Dr. King was teaching something that applied to racism in the United States, but which speaks to a universal human need. I did it too fast. I'll do it again. He was teaching something that applied to racism in the United States, but which speaks to a universal human need. Put another way, he was preaching the gospel. And the gospel must be preached in every generation, must be served in every generation. The fields of the gospel must, must, must always be attended to in every generation. And you do not have to be, you do not have to be a master orator to preach the gospel. An infant's cry is articulate enough to form a bulwark against vengeance. You do not have to be a movement tactician to preach the gospel. An infant's cry says enough to speak in the heart saying, protect this holy one, this one a little lower than the angels. The mere fact that there is much to do should not discourage you. It only means that at last you have put your shoulder to the plow of work that really matters, of work that will take your whole life. May God help us in that. Amen.